Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rajaji Namas. He's an associate professor from Michigan University, a uh, rheumatology consultant uh, in uh, Cleveland, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, presenting about systemic sclerosis and the ILD. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, thanks uh, for this invitation. This is my second year at the Saudi uh, Rheumatology Conference. It, it really gives me truly the honor to be, uh, to be a speaker in this conference. Uh, uh, as Dr. Uh, Omer tells me, marra uh, mabsut. Okay, so today I'll be talking about uh, systemic sclerosis associated ILD. I know it's the end of the day, so I'll be a little bit uh, fast. Uh, I have no uh, financial dis disclosures. So today's agenda, I'll be uh, sharing with you a case scenario. We'll be talking about risk stratification. I'm sure all of us, we know the management of, of how to uh, treat or what, what are the available uh, medications to treat uh, systemic sclerosis ILD. But the main question that we are challenged all, always with during clinics is whom to treat, when to treat, when to stop. I think these are the, the main three questions that we face during our uh, daily practice. I'll just share with you over the years, how do I uh, uh, read uh, PFT? I think this should be part of our practice, especially uh, residents and fellows with interest in rheumatology. They should uh, have a look at, uh, or have a look at the PFT uh, each time they see patients with uh, scleroderma. Uh, we will talk, we'll talk uh, we'll elaborate more about who to treat for systemic sclerosis. I'll share with you some local data and then we'll end up with what the recommended therapies and we had a recent publication about consensus recommendations of scleroderma ILD. So this is a 36 years old uh, Middle Eastern lady presented to the clinic end of the day with uh, uh, a couple of months history of shortness of breath, uh, coughing, she, she used uh, an albuterol inhaler, uh, not doing well. Uh, she had uh, joint pain and puffiness of the digits since the age of 32. And for fellows, this should be documented in the history because this is the duration that you count, the, the duration of the disease. I mean, when we ask about is it early or late, I think this is the, the, the number that tell you exactly how long the disease is there. Uh, she had Reynolds phenomenon, it was triphasic, and she had a positive ANA with neocleolar pathogen. She had a modified Rodman skin score of 16, and she had abnormal nail fault capillaroscope. She was on hydroxychloroquine, and I did the chest x-ray and an echo, and they were unremarkable. So seeing such a patient, I think the first thing to do is you need to stratify this patient. Is where, where are we? Should I, do, should I proceed to the next step and do a high-resolution CT or stop there? So these are a couple of uh, 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 red flags that you need to look into uh, when stratifying such a patient. Uh, is it a male or a female? We know that males have a higher risk of developing ILD. Older age is another risk that uh, patients can have an earlier disease or a, a more uh, uh, aggressive, uh, aggressive ILD. Uh, you know, I think we are fortunate with scleroderma that we have a lot of tools that we can stratify patients. And for a fact, we know that up to 50% of patients with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis are at, at, uh, are at the risk of developing ILD versus 35 percent in patients with limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Uh, disease duration is very important. I think this is one of the, the, the main important uh, 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 question that you need to ask during the history. Is it an early disease? Is it less than five years or more than five years? And we know that patients with less than five years are at a higher risk of developing ILD. And of, of course, the modified Rodden skin score is a surrogate of internal organ involvement. The higher the skin score, the more chances that there will be either uh, lung or a heart involvement. Serologies, uh, uh, we know that nuclear pathogen is more seen in diffuse versus centromere more seen in limited. We know that patients with SCL70 are more prone uh, developing uh, lung disease. Uh, lung predominant disease versus anti-centromere antibody are more predominant uh, heart disease. We know that UR3, RMP are more uh, prone uh, of developing uh, uh, a kind of cancer, so you should uh, risk and stratify those patients according to their age for an underlying malignancy and, of course, uh, renal cell crisis. Uh, and PFT will talk about it uh, in the next slide. And, of course, we know that the majority of patients with scleroderma have an NSIP pathogen, about 70 percent. Even having, having said that, UIP pathogen can be present in patients with systemic sclerosis, and I don't want to uh, 
uh, indulge too much in echo. I think this is a different talk. Uh, <clears throat> if we rely only on history, I think we'll miss most of our patients. Uh, most of the, the signs that you see in a history are non-specific, such as fatigue, weight loss, shortness of breath. And if we just relay, uh, rely on physical exam also, we, we need you know, to examine the lungs uh, very specifically, looking for uh, valcro uh, basilar uh, uh, crackles. Having said that, I think every patient with systemic sclerosis needs to have a high-resolution CT at one, uh, 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 during the initial evaluation to rule out an underlying uh, subclinical, what we call subclinical uh, ILD. And as I mentioned, about 78% of the patients can have an NSIP pathogen, and a small proportion can have a UIP pathogen. This is a very important uh, uh, graph that it's, it's like a map uh, where you can stratify patients during the, the course of their disease. And again, the, the, the disease starts from the first non Raynaud's phenomena. Patients, if you see patients less than five years, I mean, you should be highly alerted that they may have an underlying occult or subclinical uh, ILD, even though it will be missed on, on, by clinical history or, or exam. So, so you do a CT and you know you got a couple of scenarios and you know the question here arises who do you treat do you treat the first one with mild disease do you treat the second uh, CT do you treat the third and i think this is one of the challenges uh, i think we face when when uh, when seeing such patients we have a lot we have currently we have a good number of uh, uh, FDA approved and non FDA approved medications but still we are challenged what are the, what's the best approach when do we treat do we wait or do we uh, just go ahead with starting a medication? And if we look here, if we CT every patient with scleroderma, about 70% of patients will have a type of an ILD. And the question comes again, do you treat everybody with, I, with, with, sub, with ILD or not? And if we, in the room here, if we present the case, I think we will split into maybe four or five groups. Some of us will say wait, some of us will say treat. So it's, it's, I think it's a, there, we don't have a, a strict guidelines on when to treat or uh, when to initiate therapies. I think this is very important, so I, I want to just take a couple of minutes on how uh, to interpret a PFT. Uh, over the years, I think it, it became part of my practice. I think the first question is, is, is it an acceptable? Uh, so uh, I think I th you need to look into the height, weight, all these baseline uh, characteristics, if they're smokers or not, and the race and gender is very important. I think the other most important point, if you inherit a patient from another institution, you need to make sure that the, the machines are, are similar or different because you still you can see a variability in, in, in interpretation of, of a PFT. The second question comes, you, you need to look into the spirometry and the gas exchange. The first part is the spirometry. <clears throat> if the FEV1 over FVC uh, ratio is low, you, you are 100% sure that this more an obstructive airway disease, you're more talking about asthma, and if it's uh, normal or high, then here we're talking more about a restrictive lung disease. The next step to uh, further stratify patients, you look at the predicted forced vital capacity, if it's less than 80, then you can stratify patients to mild, moderate, and severe. The next step that I look into is the DLCO, which is the gas exchange. Uh, if it's normal, you're talking about a non-pulmonary uh, etiology, and if it's low, then you are uh, talking more about pulmonary vascular disease. So I think uh, this is just a, an ABC on how to quickly just, you know, in our busy clinics, just to have a look at, uh, uh, interpret a PFT. I think this is a very important point. If you see a very low uh, DLCO and, uh, and uh, uh, a nearly normal uh, force vital capacity, predicted force vital capacity, this makes you more think that maybe this is a, there's an underlying uh, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, and there's this uh, calculation that you can divide FVC over DLCO if it's more than 1.5, then also this gives you an uh, indication that you may need to proceed with, with having an echo. Who should we treat? I think uh, these are the, the, the things, uh, the, the, the points that uh, are important. If uh, there's an FVC decline of more than 10% in 12 months, uh, if there's a 5 to 9%, uh, you know, I, I don't memorize them. I think it's good to put them in front of you. But I think the most important one is in the box. And if you compare uh, a PFT, if you do a PFT today and after three months you compare, you need to take into account the acceptable, uh, acceptable test variability. And if you look at FVC, you can see a variability up to 
whereas the DLC load goes up to 15%. So if you see that 10%, it doesn't mean that there's a major change in FVC or up to 15% in DLCO. A very old study, but it's a very crucial study that we learned a lot from. Uh, it was in 94. And the most, or what we call the window of opportunity. So this, when you apply the concept that we know from RA and other diseases and scleroderma, I think this is one of the, the lessons we learned, that the, the first four years of diagnosing a patient with systemic sclerosis from the first non Raynaud's phenomena are the first four years. And, and those four years, you should be cautious and be more aggressive with screening for uh, ILD. If you pass those four years, I said the risk is still there, but it's not as, as common as the first four years. This is another way of stratification. I think this needs the help of, of uh, uh, pulmonary uh, radiology colleagues, and then you can stratify uh, um, uh, according to the involvement, lung involvement on a high resolution CT. If it's less than 20%, more than 20%, and 10 to 20, and this tells you how often you need to repeat uh, the, the, the pulmonary function test. So we go back to our uh, case, uh, as, as shown here, this is her nail fold capillaroscopy. You see uh, dilated nail folds, there's some microhemorrhages, there's uh, hemosiderin, and we did a CT, high resolution CT, and as you can see here, there's a ground glass opacities with dilated esophagus. So she had uh, uh, confirmed uh, 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 systemic sclerosis ILD. Let me share with you this. I think I presented this last year in the eighth uh, uh, SSRC, and at that time it was still under, uh, uh, we were working on publishing it, and it, it's honestly a piece of, piece of art that among all rheumatologists in the UAE, we worked together to publish this paper. And for the first time, we looked at the prevalence of, of ILD, and it's about 3.37 per 100,000 and uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension at ILD was 1.2 among patients whom are uh, from the UE. I mean, we have the whole registry, and uh, you know, in, the, in my clinic, I see more than 100 patients with systemic sclerosis. What are the recommended therapies? Uh, I know all of us, we, we know, all, uh, just we'll briefly go uh, over each one. The only FDA-approved medications were Ofiv and Tenenib, uh, which I think we have the, the next session. We'll, they will talk more about it, and we have recently tocilizumab. So this was a landmark study. This was a proof of concept study that was done in 2006, and they used IV cyclophosphamide. They gave six sessions versus placebo, and then after 12, six months, they sw switched all patients to, uh, to ASA, and uh, uh, there was a modest improvement in the FVC over a six-month period. And I think this was a, a, a very interesting study that made uh, authors or, uh, you know, go further and uh, look into this uh, further. Uh, they looked, uh, the, this is the SLS1 where they gave patients oral cyclophosphamide, one to two milligrams per kilogram per, per day for 12 months with a follow-up period versus placebo, I think what was standard of care at that time. And interestingly, it was a positive study. Uh, to, uh, the primary endpoint was at 12 months, and as you can see here, there's a split in the curve. Uh, there was a, 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 a significant change in the FVC over a 12-month period, and this was maintained up to 18 months, but then the, the benefit collapsed, and this was something that <coughs> was depressing. And, you know, you can, uh, I'm sure, we, you know, with cyclophosphamide, we are, we are always uh, concerned about the side effect profile of the medication. <coughs> so we'll go historically. Uh, the second drug that they looked into was azathioprine versus, uh, versus oral cyclophosphamide. It was a negative study. Patients with uh, whom were commenced on cyclophosphamide did better than uh, patients with uh, whom were on uh, azathioprine. And this was, I think it's not one of the, the, the medications that we give for ILD. We give it for uh, uh, other uh, manifestations of systemic sclerosis. Then came the SLS2, which is... Uh, Oral cyclophosphamide versus mycophenolate, 1.5 gram twice daily for 12 months, and it was maintained up to 24 months. Uh, the, the, oh, the cyclophosphamide arm was switched to a placebo arm. And again, this was a non-inferiority study where they showed that the benefit of, of uh, mycophenolate is as good as uh, cyclophosphamide uh, with less uh, side effect profile. And this, I think, made a major change in our uh, practice. If we go 10 years uh, back, I think uh, I, I used to give a lot of cyclophosphamides over the last uh, 10 years. I, I, you know, I prefer uh, uh, 
mycophenolate due to the low side effect profile. Uh, SLS3, this is something new. Uh, this is patients, uh, uh, this was in Michigan, uh, by, led it by Professor Dinesh Khanna, uh, where they gave mycophenolate, uh, one, the maximum dose, 1.5 gram twice daily with placebo versus mycophenolate with perfenidone, which is an antifibrotic approved for uh, IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's an, uh, it downregulates TGF beta and pro collagen 1 and 2. And uh, in the ACR uh, last year, it was, uh, the data was presented, and they can see that there is an Im improvement in, in, uh, in the decline in the FVC in, at, uh, at six months in patients who were commenced on mycophenolate and perfenidone versus uh, perfenidone. But again, this benefit collapsed after six months. So I think uh, we need more, more, more studies. Or, uh, this was a phase two study. Rituximab, uh, again, this was a proof of concept study, eight, eight subjects, but I think we were waiting for such studies. We use it a lot in patients with ILD, and we are curious, you know, is it, uh, does it work? Is it similar to the real world evidence that we know, or is there, there's difference? And there was significant increase, and here they gave the dose of, uh, weekly dose of uh, 375 milligrams per meter square over four weeks, and then repeated every six months. And again, there's a modest improvement in the FVC. Uh, and the uh, DLCO increased significantly at two years, but it took a while to improve. With this concept, they gave another open label trial, they gave 18 patients where they combined rituximab and mycophenolate uh, together, and again came a paper in 2021 where they combined. And I think that the, uh, we do this during our clinical practice, but the, the message that we learned from the, these studies that safety, I think we are always cautious about you know, combining two therapies if you give Rituximab with mycophenolate, is there a risk of infection or you know, neutropenia? What usually I do in my practice, I, when I give rituximab, I wait four weeks, and I go down 50% uh, reduction in the mycophenolate. I continue mycophenolate till the next uh, infusion. But in this study, they didn't see any difference when they combined rituximab and mycophenolate. The only thing that they saw that there was a reduction in prednisone, but they didn't see any changes in the, in the uh, lung parameters. With this came uh, this very interesting study from Japan, the DESIRE study, a very uh, nice study. It, 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 uh, uh, it made into two phases, the blinded treatment where they gave placebo, which is background therapy with you know, uh, other uh, immunosuppressive therapies versus a uh, weekly dose of, of rituximab according to weight. And then they had uh, 24 weeks, that's the primary endpoint, and then they switched everybody, the, the, the placebo arm and the the, the treatment arm, uh, they received the, the, uh, the drug. And as, as shown here, it's very interesting that there was a split in the curve, uh, both in the skin scores and in the lung parameters. Uh, I, you know, when, uh, when I hear from other speakers about the study, there's always a concern about uh, the, the, how the study was made. And, you know, it, it, the, 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 the results are very impressive to believe. That's something, you know, uh, I think that raises a concern of, you know, rising questions. Well, how, how do we get such a, a strong benefit? And, you know, the authors, if you read uh, the limitations that every, everyone receiving rituximab received a loading dose of steroids. And they conclude that maybe this, the benefit, that's robust benefit that you can see with the skin or the lungs are from the steroids. And they concluded that maybe you need a, a, to, to run the study at a larger scale. This was also uh, a phase two trial. Ofif, nintenineb, uh, 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 it's a thyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, this was the first FDA-approved medication for uh, scleroderma. Uh, they had a placebo arm or uh, Ofif 150 twice daily. And as, you, as uh, shown previously also in the inbuilt trial, there was a, a significant decline, uh, uh, delta change in the FVC over time in patients who received the drug versus the, the and, uh, so th th this drug is mainly given for, uh, for lungs. I don't, there's no studies for the skin. And uh, finally, we have the tocilizumab, which uh, I was part of at, uh, during the time I was in Michigan. And again, it's, it, 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 uh, it's uh, two, co two uh, studies. We have a blinded uh, part, and we have the open-labeled part at 24 weeks. Uh, uh, and as you can see here, the, 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 the primary outcome failed. However, if we look at the secondary outcome, 
there was a, a, a clinically meaningful improvement in the, in the lung parameters in patients who were commenced on the treatment, uh, tocilizumab versus placebo. What would, what, if we reflect all these uh, medications during our practice, this is from our registry in the UAE, and uh, I think we, all, we are more in favor of uh, mycophenolate. We did like a small uh, uh, subgroup analysis. I think it depends on the center or sometimes maybe where you are uh, trained or uh, experienced maybe with uh, treating such an orphan disease. Uh, in our center, we use more uh, antifibrotic medications. We use more CELSEP. I see in other, uh, maybe remote hospitals, they use cyclophosphamide, maybe because of insurance issues and other technical issues. This is a very nice uh, algorithm that we uh, recently uh, submitted to the Lancet of Rheumatology. That's the one. And uh, very uh, easy to use. It's like the grappa uh, during the clinical practice. And you can uh, classify patients into subclinical ILD, and this in the, in the small box tells you what is, what's the term, what's the meaning of subclinical ILD or a clinical ILD. And then it gives you that high-risk population that you need to treat. High CRP, male, early disease, less than five years, and then it gives you this you know, nice algorithm which medication to use. So it, it, it can help a little bit to tailor your options if you don't have that uh, much support from a multidisciplinary meeting. This is a very simplified approach, and we recently published a paper uh, stratifying the risk factors for, uh, from a large cohort in Michigan, and these are the, the things that you need to be aware of, or you know, the red flags that you need to uh, be careful with in patients uh, who are at higher risk of developing ILD, including males, early disease, high, high CRP, uh, if there's an extent more than 20%, uh, anti-topo isomerase, isomerase uh, positivity also were associated with a rapid decline in the positive predicted uh, force vital capacity. Finally, I think this is the most important uh, point. I think it's, this is not a one-man show. It's hard to treat a patient with ILD by yourself, uh, with scleroderma ILD. I need, you need this multidisciplinary approach. Uh, what we do on Tuesday, we send all the patients that we need to discuss. On Wednesday, we meet. As you can see, it's a very uh, large team. We have uh, 12 pulmonologists. We have pathologists, and then we formulate a note, uh, even for legal purposes, and we keep it for our patients. And then we again reevaluate patients in couple, another couple of months. With this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, to address any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we open the floor for questions. Uh, I would like to thank both speakers for giving this review on, uh, on 